warm first family welcome, but also like to especially welcome the Reverend Layton. That was quite glad she's with us visiting this morning, so glad to have you. Uh, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And I'll also with you. Stand fellowship for the while the choir comes down. Oh, my. So, some have 
In 2 Samuel that we read, we see King David, a man who had a passion for justice. I think we can all agree to that. A great zeal for the Word of God. Amen? Amen? And we see this David, upon hearing the story the prophet Nathan spun for him, ready and willing to condemn the rich man who took the poor man's land. And yet apparently, I'm able to see that the story was about who? Himself. David could apply the Word of God to others, but he couldn't recognize how the Word spoke about him. That's a dangerous place to be in. I've been there before. I'll admit that. Preach a sermon, get home two hours later. Whoa. Wait a minute. I tell people I'm most often preaching to myself. In Galatians 2, we see Peter. Peter felt free to live like a Gentile when in their presence and felt free to eat with them and socialize with them and the freedom of the gospel and back off from that freedom when he was faced with external pressures and instead go back to the old way of excluding and isolating, the old way of judging Gentiles as impure and in the need of keeping the law of Moses. And so it is thus that Paul then is forced to say to him, you're a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Peter applied the word of the law of God, of the law of God to the lives of the Gentiles about him, but he did not do so to himself. He lived in the freedom of the gospel. And in the gospel, uh, Luke chapter 7, we see Simon the Pharisee, a man who had a zeal for God, a passion for the word of God, opened his home to welcome Jesus in. A very good thing to do. And yet, at the same time, he closed his heart to the woman who anointed Jesus' feet at his table and ministered to his needs. Simon named her as the sinner that she probably most surely was, as are we all. He judged her, even as she did the works of love and hospitality, though, that the law and the traditions of the elders suggested they ought to perform. We often judge others. We often apply the word to them, and then we fail to see how it applies to our own lives. Right. We become intolerant. We become unloving. And we act as Jesus puts the Simon as if we are forgiven little, therefore we love little. Now next Sunday is Father's Day, so men, maybe this is especially important for us to listen to as we consider its application for our lives. There's a movement, anybody ever heard of the movement called Promise Keepers? Kind of swept the United States and I guess kind of Canada and around the world too. Um, is not quite as much, but uh, pretty much around the world uh, last few years. And the aim of promise keepers is simple. It's said to get men to be godly, to honor and obey Christ, to be good husbands and fathers, and to keep the promises that they made to God, to their families, and to their churches. And men often will try to set the agenda for their wives, their kids, their jobs. They try to fix things according to their own standards of what is right. And wrong. But they, as the promise keeper movement suggests, often fail to fix themselves first. They often fail to apply the word of God to their own lives and to keep the promises they made, the covenants, if you will, that they have made with Christ. And then latter on with their families and with their kids and their jobs. Our children, our wives, our husbands, our brothers, our sisters, our neighbors. You know, I did a whole sermon series on who's our neighbor and who was our neighbor. Everybody, right? They don't need, all of those books I just mentioned, they don't need an analyzing of what they're doing right or wrong. And for us then to apply the Word of God, the Word of Christ to our own lives, first and foremost, is what they need. And then, leading by example, people will see what is in us. And often without even speaking a word, without even preaching one sermon, without anything coming out of our mouths, people who meet you from time to time and over and over again will step back and say, you'll never know about it. 
and they'll say, gosh, I wonder what they have in their lives. Starts that little spark. And from that little spark, we'll start a raging fire in search of the Lord in their life, of deepening their faith. They need to see us all set an example by our own faithfulness, by us living out God's Word in our lives. And we need it too, each one of us, because in the end, we're not answerable to God regarding the sins that other people commit, but for our own. Indeed, we need to apply the Word to our own lives before we get in trouble, before we sin. This is one of those sermons where people tell me later on in the weeks of preaching shoes stepping on toes. So they don't have to wear hard-toed shoes to church. Just pull them back under the fuse a little bit. You'll be all right. I always tell people when I'm preaching a sermon, if I, if I say something, and I would never point a finger at you, but if I was saying something and it seemed like an imagery that I was pointing a finger at you, trust me, I have a thumb coming back at myself. We're all in this boat together, amen? That's right. We're all God's children. We all sin. That's right. But what we need is to do our best to apply God's Word to our life and try our best daily, before our feet even hit the floor in the morning, to just say, God, show me your will for my life and then help me to do it. That's all you can do. That's right. And when we do our best at that, God does give us that help. Because we then start remembering that we are forgiven much. And then we start to do what? Love much. We need to develop a godly humility and faithfulness. We need to keep our promises rather than to worry a whole lot about how other people keep theirs. And more than that, we need to remember that not only are we called not to judge others, but we are called to go beyond judgment and to allow God to work in us and through us for others. Amen? We are called to be Ambassadors for Christ. Christ is in us and all around us. And the Holy Spirit dwells within each of us that have given our lives to Him. But we don't see Him physically among us anymore. But what the world does see are those of us that claim to be His children. They see our actions. They see our inactions. Often not doing the things that we're supposed to be doing does more damage than doing the things that we're not supposed to be doing. We are called to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Ones who let God make His appeal through us. Ones who are instruments of His love. Ones who reach out to others with compassion. Who aren't afraid to be on the same side of the street with those who we may want to cross the street to avoid. To eat at God's table with them. That's why I preface any time that we have any visitors at all with the Lord's table when we come to that portion of our service which we celebrate every Sunday here in the Disciples of Christ Church. And I tell them we practice open communion. If they are in if their heart have a faith relationship with the Lord, they are welcome to come to our table in this church. Because it's not our table. It's not my table. It's God's table. This do in remembrance of me. We welcome all. You know, a lot of what God had done throughout history hadn't seemed fair to people. Especially hadn't seemed fair to those who struggled day by day to keep the law of God. Think about it. Why was Jacob not denounced by God for his conniving ways? Why was David not completely disowned by God for his disgraceful actions? Why was the adulteress not condemned by God for her open disregard of the moral? Why was Peter not disavowed by God after his blatant denial of Christ in the courtyard? Why was Paul not banished by God forever because of his persecutions of the Christians in his early life? Why? That's the question. Why? And the answer is because there's nothing in the world so tenacious and so resolute and so forthright as the grace of God. Amen. Amen. The Gospel of John tells us God didn't send the world, uh, Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. And thank God for that. The word that God applies on our lives is the word of forgiveness and the word of love. And as we turn to God, we discover that God is turned toward us and always has been. He's calling us to be loved, and He's also calling us to go out of love. 
and live that word in our own lives. May we be the ones who realize that we too, like Jacob, like David, like the woman caught in adultery, like Peter, like Paul, and the sinful woman who anointed Jesus' feet, and I could go on, we are forgiven much. And may we be ones who apply that word to our lives and then love much, even as we are loved much, day by day. It's God's will for us that we do so. The will of God and His Son Jesus who came and gave His life for us that though dead in our sins, we might live in Him and live with Him one day. Yeah. And we might open our lives completely to the gift of His Holy Spirit and so be given the power to love one another even as He loves us. And to that, all I can say is thanks be to God and Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, make our lives through Jesus, our true vine, living branches of faith and hope and love so that the existence of others might be enriched by our own lives. And may they grow mature with the fruit of your Holy Spirit, that Spirit given to us by you, our Heavenly Father, and by your Son and our brother, Jesus Christ. Gracious God, again, we ask that you help us to be persons, persons who unconditionally love, just as you love. Make us a people that don't place demands or conditions on those that we accept, and equally, who don't give up the freedom that Christ won for us by trying to win the love of others or of you, by seeking to conform to conditions that they might set upon loving us. For our brothers and sisters and all their diverse needs today, again, we pray, remembering in you those who were lifted up by name earlier. We pray with thankfulness for those prayers that you've already answered and with hearts of hope for those things that are yet to be. And now, as we prepare to sing a hymn of commitment, we pray, God, that you would give courage to those that feel the need to make a decision for you this day, whatever it might be. Salvation, rededication, baptism, church membership, prayer support. May they come forward to share the decision with us and know that they are among concerned and loving friends who will support them in their faith journey. And all of these things and so much more that escape us this morning, we pray in the name of Christ Jesus, your Son, and of our brother and Lord. Amen. Number 337. If you have anything at all to share, please come. Again, know you're among friends. We'll sing together. Jesus calls us over the tomb.
Bible school this week. Keep us in prayer, all the workers, all the uh, students that God will send to us. Uh, may we be faithful to teach and train them in the ways of the Lord and have a little fun this week and uh, show them that coming to church is cool. You know, kids think that coming to church is not cool, and that's unfortunate. Uh, we still have fun, though. Uh, so it's great to be in God's house with you. If you need me for any reason at all, uh, give me a call this week. Keep those on our sick list in your prayers and those other concerns that we have going on. I did forget to mention Miss Simmons lost her sister-in-law this week. Uh, so we'll certainly be in prayer for you and the family. So keeping you in our thoughts. If you need anything at all, please give me a call. Right now, let's respond with our commissioning statement together. You know, so that's there in your program. We'll follow that. I'll give the benediction. We'll have our choral blessing. In the power of the risen Lord, we now go forth into the world to fulfill our calling as the people of God, the body of Christ. Go, love and care for one another in the name of Christ our Savior, and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, this both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.